So for now, tonight, the Kenyan government has been thrown back to the drawing board after the Court of Appeal declined to extend an order allowing the government to continue collecting uh, taxes, that is the housing levy. Now, the trial court pulled that, uh, actually ruled that public interest tilts in favor um, of not granting the order sought by the government. But on the other hand, National Assembly Majority Leader Kimani Chungwa has appealed to the judiciary to give priority to the interest of the people, especially government projects. Now, President William Ruto has asserted that the affordable housing projects will continue despite court order, saying the program also seeks to address unemployment in the country. But the Federation of Kenya Employers CEO Jacqueline Mugo has urged its members to stop housing levy deduction from workers until the matter is determined or a ruling stating otherwise is issued. At the same time, the government has been dealt a blow after the High Court halted an, uh, a plan to deploy police officers to Haiti for peacekeeping mission. But the government says it will appeal the High Court uh, decision uh, that was given today by Justice Chacha Mwita. And with me in studio tonight, I am with Okia Omutata, Busia Senator, you know, one of those people um, in the country who went to the court challenging the government's decision um, when it comes to deducting Kenyans, that percentage for the housing levy. And it was not alone at the corridors of justice. It was with uh, LSK president, uh, the Loose Society of Kenya president, that is Eric Therouri, seated on my immediate right. Um, he will be telling us much more what, how that played out at the corridors of justice. And of course, not a new face here on KT News, uh, Dennis Anyoka, an advocate of the High Court, brilliant minds here. Uh, legally represented and also politically represented. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Let me begin with uh, two gentlemen who are accused by the government. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good I'm using the word accused, allegedly, of, um, you know, uh, bribing the courts to sort of like m make rulings that hinder the government projects. Um, let me begin with Akio Tata, Senator. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on this uh, show tonight. When we talk of a judiciary, usually we are talking of indi an individual judge. Yeah. You when know, you say the judiciary will decide, you're basically <laughs> saying it's a, it's a single judge will sit and decide. Mm -hmm. So if I bribe the single a judge, they should say single out the judge, charge me the bribe giver, and charge him or her the bribe taker. But just to throw things around, make allegations, mm -hmm. damning people's reputations and whatever. And if you look at these judges, if there's a job I would not want to take up, the job of a judge. Because look at these people when they sit for all that time, I don't know what happens to their backbones. They do a lot of work. They have to go home. They have to go and write judgments. They have to go and read what you have been arguing before them. So these are people who really have a very, very difficult life. So for somebody to just recklessly go and talk like they do, they, 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 they have been doing, it's, it's really unfair to these people. Mm -hmm. If there's credible evidence that somebody has been compromised, there are procedures to follow. And I'm sure when the president of the LSK will say, okay, he will be on the forefront to get, to, to get a judge out of the bar, mm -hmm. any, of the bench. Mm -hmm. So I don't, see, I don't see, because judges are even members of the LSK, so the president will be on the forefront to get them out of, out of the bench. Mm -hmm. And recently you saw Justice uh, Chitambwe being removed because the uh, allegations against him were approved. Mm -hmm. But just to wake up and make allegations without even, I don't know whether they call them allegations or whatever they are. But are you planning to, to challenge those statements in court? Well, I've got a matter I'm trying to get uh, the police to record my statement so I can begin the process. <laughs> <laughs> now, the case has been transferred from uh, two days ago. Justice Mugabe transferred it from Nairobi to Kisi. So I'm supposed to go to Kisi on uh, 31st. Mm -hmm. To deal with the case, All right. but the issue is that I, to me it was a very, very, it's a very, very serious allegation. All right. Because the independence of the judiciary, the independence of the judge before whom I appear, is not for his own benefit; it's for my benefit. The judge, if the judge is biased or not biased, it doesn't matter. But it's me who suffers when the judge is biased. Mm -hmm. It's me who benefits when the judge is not biased. Mm -hmm. So it is something that for me is very, very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. And I would be asking that uh, either the president withdraws the matter mm -hmm. or I build a file to wait for him to leave office, then I deal with him. All right, all right. Those are your sentiments. 
Uh, they do not represent the sentiments of KTN News. No, or no, the no. I said I, I said yeah, I. Or the standard um, media group. Um, LSK President Eric Theory, you're one of those people that has been mentioned by some senior politicians in this country, including um, that latest demonstration that you held, being accused of, you know, allowing politicians to, to sort of like use the LSK. It, 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 it's, I, I, I mean, it, it really puts into question why did LSK move to court to challenge this housing levy? Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the studio. We, we not only uh, challenged uh, the housing levy in court, we actually presented a memorandum to the relevant committee. We pointed out the illegalities in the process. We pointed out the illegalities to the PS uh, housing and to the government and we told them in no uncertain terms that if you want to see this initiative take root, do not pursue the route that you are on. They didn't listen. And because they didn't listen and because we felt strongly about uh, that issue and we felt that uh, there were certain uh, constitutional questions that needed to be raised, mm -hmm. we approached the court. And the, 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 the court, when it delivered its judgment, of course, on all the consolidated petition, mm -hmm. it agreed with the arguments uh, that we had all along presented before parliament, uh, before the relevant uh, peers in terms of uh, the, the ministry that is in charge of the project, and uh, the arguments that were presented in court. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it did not surprise us at all that the court completely agreed with what we were saying and completely agreed with what other petitioners were saying mm -hmm. with regards to the legality of the housing fund. And, and it's as clear as day and night. And so, uh, for us, um, it's, it's, it's a vindication mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the law was not followed and that uh, uh, the lesson here should be that we need to undertake our procedures and the policies that the government wants to implement uh, within the confines of the law. Because when it, that is done, right. then we do not have this kind of complaints and then you do not have uh, uh, these allegations flying <laughs> around <laughs> uh, that uh, we probably have uh, extremely deep pockets. Mm -hmm to the extent that <laughs> we, can <bribe> <laughs> we can bribe judges because no one has an interest, a personal interest in sabotaging the uh, uh, projects that the government comes up with. But the law society has a statutory mandate to advise government on matters relating to law mm -hmm. and to protect the constitution. Right. And what we do is purely to look at what the law says mm -hmm. and whether this project or this policy or this law fits within the four corners of the Constitution. Right. And when it does, we say, go ahead. When it does not, we raise issues and we challenge it in the necessary forums that have been set about by the Constitution. So right. those that uh, sometimes want to suggest that the law society is at the beck and call of uh, any political party, uh, actually just introducing politics in the management of the law society. And of course, you, re you know, uh, we've had very unfortunate statements coming from politicians saying that because the law society is now going into elections, mm -hmm. they will now ensure that uh, they influence <laughs> the process to get <laughs> to politically uh, uh, aligned leadership. You know, those are very uh, alarming statements when they come from politicians because the law society is a professional body that has a statutory mandate mm -hmm. to defend the constitution and to advise right. on matters relating to law. All right. Anyoka, you're seated next to your president yes. of the society where <laughs> you belong. And you know, today, President William Bruto, let me just, uh, um, we, we read one of the stories um, and uh, he was saying, you know, he was saying that uh, the affordable housing project will go ahead despite the harsh housing levy ruling made by the Court of Appeal. 
and of course uh, Ruto and his Kenya Kwanza allies, the president insisted they will enact a compliant legislation that will replace and um, the now outlawed housing levy. What would you make of the president's statement today? And especially the body language as he was speaking. Um, I think uh, in my view, uh, President Ruto has either come to realization that he's not going to succeed um, in the manner and the style that is moved with the kind of the bill that he proposed, which has been challenged. But he still passionately wants to implement it. Mm -hmm. Now, the, going by the statements we're getting from the politicians surrounding him and um, what he has said in the past, is the kind of person that will get the feel that he will not want to respect the law, will not want to respect the orders. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately for the president and those who think they will be able to implement this uh, housing levy as is now, is that they do not have any legal standing where they can be able to implement that. Right. Because up, other than, you know, there's a difference between the decision that was made at the High Court and the manner in which it proceeded, and now the ruling that has been made by the Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. Remember at the High Court, there was a stay order that was granted. As to whether that was proper to be done or not, that's a debate for another day. Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, Honorable Mutata will deal with that mm -hmm. through the corridors of justice. But there was a stay. Yeah. Be it as it may, there was a stay by the court. And therefore, the government could proceed to continue receiving the levies pending the determination. Mm -hmm. Now, an application was made. Of course, the stay operated. Now, a decision has been made at the Court of Appeal that they can no longer uh, retain the stay. The state that they sought uh, through the Court of Appeal, uh, what to call uh, Rule 5 to B of the Court of Appeal rules, uh, that is no longer uh, uh, there. They, 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 they didn't get an interim orders for, for the for the, for the, for the state. Effectively, there is no legal framework upon which anybody can do the reductions or get the money. In fact, if anybody, and, and I and I'll want to see this happening, I will want to see any government that doing the reduction, because quickly, someone will move and cite people for contempt. Perhaps mm -hmm. the president may not be touched, mm -hmm. but I'm very sure there will be people who will find be. themselves uh, in the courts of justice and probably committed to civil jail. Mm -hmm. And of course, several applications, they will have serious litigation going on to try and recover this money that has been able to be deducted, of course, illegally now, mm -hmm. because there is no legal basis right, for right. that kind of reduction. And, and you know, Omutata, what Kenyans are asking is, so how do we get back our money? I think uh, when we're in court, uh, the Kenyan Revenue Authority submitted very clearly that they are scared that there might have been a lot of mess because they are also collected that money and they have no capacity to give it back, mm -hmm. you see. So I don't see, I don't know how the money is going to be given back, <laughs> but I think uh, because the government itself is broke, that money is not there. So Kenya should but, not uh, wait for that money. No, they should, and they should demand that the money be given back. Mm -hmm. No, there are other ways of giving that money back. Maybe it could be to interfere with the other deductions that the government usually takes from pay slips, mm -hmm. so that now they, they, it can be. <laughs> amortize or something so that it can be collected in that uh, manner. But uh, the important thing is that a salary is private property. You see, there's no way you can force the Uri, the president, to come and build from Tata House. And there's a very big confusion. You know, like this thing called affordable housing. We are being used like guinea pigs. It has never been done anywhere in the world. What happens in the world is called public housing. And public housing, like if you go to a place in Singapore, wherever, they come up with these very big skyscrapers, whatever, then the government allows people to come and live in on the basis of very low, low rents. But they don't own those houses. The houses remain public and are built on public land. These are affordable housing things, thing. It's what in English is called a chimera. A chimera in Greek mythology was a, a female monster that had the head of a lion, the body of a goat, and the tail of a serpent. So this chimera that the president is trying to push is something that we don't know because it's going to be put on public land, then sold to private individuals. Is that a process for privatizing public land? 
then you are saying you are going to use private money from a private individual to support another private individual to own a home. This totally, there's no logic to it. And I don't see how this thing can be done with Article 40 the way it is in the Constitution. That you have got a right to your property. And you have a right to use your property the way you want. So I don't know how they are going to do that. And if it's going to be public housing, then they just commit part of the taxes to housing. But already we are financially, um, I don't want to say, to say unstable as a country, but we are staring at a point where our economy is not good, even financially. Yes, yeah, the economy is good, not good financially because it's being mismanaged. But I'm telling you, if you, are, if you really wanted to clean up this economy, mm -hmm. begin with the budget. There's a lot of budget corruption there. You'll clean it out. <coughs> a lot of the debt you are paying is odious debt. Clean it out. Right. It's a very simple thing. Auction these characters who are borrowing money and privatizing it. They have money offshore everywhere. Do what Nigeria has done to the Abacha funds. Now follow that money and brought it back to Nigeria. All right. So it's a very easy thing to do, but you need clean hands mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Right. If you don't have clean hands yourself, <laughs> you'll be pointed at it. You see? Right. So right. that's where the problem is. So let us elect people who are clean right. to clean up the, so the, are you the clean? republic. Very clean. All right. Sparkling. <laughs> <You're sparkling. laughs> Only ACC can tell us that, Senator. They have never come um, after me. Uh, sorry. I mean, even before the week ends, after um, President William Ruto met, met Martha Kome, uh, the judiciary has once again given a ruling not favoring the government, but many looked at the judicial independence at a place whereby it was being interfered with, with the executive uh, after that meeting. But today, the government not getting that favorable ruling, has the judiciary rescued itself from sort of like that um, negative uh, thought that Kenyans had after that meeting, based on today's rulings? No, not really, because you do not look at uh, isolated incidences. You look at the global picture. And uh, the concern that a lot of us have is that uh, the independence of judiciary uh, can be undermined both overtly and covertly. And uh, the discussion, if we take what came out of the communication mm -hmm. as what was being discussed, in itself has a solution in the Constitution. Because the Constitution has said that the judiciary should be given financial autonomy as part of the design to insulate the independence of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. And so what this means is that there's a judiciary fund that has been established that is supposed to be a charge on the consolidated fund that has never been fully operationalized to date. So the aspect of uh, the Chief Justice going to State House, the picture of the Chief Justice going to meet the PS Treasury with a begging bowl asking, please give us money for additional judges. Please give us money for this. Give us money for this. Undermines the independence of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Because the constitutional design is that it frowns upon mm -hmm. that kind of arrangement. And so we, that is why we are having a problem. Because we, instead of those meetings, what the chief justice and the judiciary should be telling the executive and parliament fully operationalize the judiciary fund as the constitution has envisaged and give us a fair share of our resources so that we can also be able to drive government agenda. But from your statement, um, theory, looks like you have a concern with the president's statement on that particular day. Um, because I'm, I'm saying the president's statement because it was a press release that was sent to the media yes. houses when he said, I, yet I will release, you know, this amount of funds to the judiciary to employ 36 new judges. Yet, it is parliament that is supposed to be doing the budget. That, 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 and that's where the problem is. That is actually where the problem is because the... What, what we are getting is a situation where we are individualizing mm -hmm. 
the country instead of institutionalizing the country. There is a process. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, of course, the president is the head of state. And of course, he, he unifies the three arms of government in terms of uh, policy. But you know, there is one thing that uh, a lot of people have not understood, that when the president goes out of the country to market Kenya as an investment destination, everything is placed into context. When he sits in a meeting with the investors, they'll be telling him that the laws you have in your country are not uh, suitable for attracting investment. Mm -hmm. And so they'll move to parliament to create the laws that will attract investment. Then the investors will say, even if we bring our money there and the laws are good, how sure are we that in case of a conflict, mm -hmm. we are going to face a court that is efficient, a court that is independent? Mm -hmm. And then they look again at the court. So it is only when the laws and the dispute resolution mechanisms are favorable for investment that the investors will come in and bring their money. And that right. is where the trinity of the three arms of government then comes in so that the aspect of interdependence mm -hmm. plays at that level. So when the judiciary is requesting for resources to be able to run its operation, it is not requesting or it is not seeking a favor. Right. But when it is treated mm -hmm. as if the judiciary is being done a favor, mm -hmm. then that situation, when it continues for a long time, it undermines the independence of the All judiciary. Right. Because this is a question of confidence. In the that, yes, that you see it and you see how the judiciary is behaving. Like right now, with this decision, people are feeling the judiciary is independent, is independent because it has made a decision against. It is that aspect of seeing that the judiciary is able to make its decision, it's able to run its operation, it does not always look back to the executive to ask, give us money to do ABCD, to do ABCD, because that aspect in itself mm -hmm. then right. builds the confidence, and that is All what right. we were complaining about. Right. And, and Anyoka, um, the trial court, that is the appellate court, stated that the housing levy was introduced without a legal framework. And the president says a new low housing bill is being enacted so that the housing levy can be aligned in accordance with the court's order. What is your take? Because um, I'm just trying to understand, just make me understand, because when they started this whole um, deduction, you know, first it was um, voluntary, then I, it came to being a levy tax. Didn't they not know that there was no legal framework? What is your take? <laughs> Of course, I would be asking the same question what they didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> because clearly, uh, apparently, either they knew and they ignored. I mean, just even before we had the discussion, I, I was asking uh, myself, and I was uh, a bit loudly, the president has enough legal minds that can be able to advise him virtually on anything. Mm -hmm. There are colleagues working uh, in, in the, within the government the institutions that can advise him. It's either the advice is not taken or the advice is not reaching the president. Mm -hmm. It's the eighth of the two. I'm not sure which one is the position. However, the president or the executive, mm -hmm. uh, if he has an agenda and, and he feels that he has to push it, he, he has to put it within a legal context that is acceptable within the constitutional framework that we have. And if he means what he says, uh, then we should not even be pursuing this matter at the court. We should simply withdraw and apologize to Kenyans for taking the Kenyans on this road and sit down. He has a memorandum from the LSK. He has listened to people. He crafts the government, you know, the, the, the government through the relevant ministry, crafts the relevant legislation. It goes to the parliament. It will be uh, examined whether it's correct. Then once it's passed as law, then we'll again examine as lawyers because that is our statute <laughs> mandate to say, and every Kenyan, of course, will have a, a duty to look at it and say, yeah. does this now fit within mm -hmm. uh, the, the constitutional uh, mechanisms that we have? If it is the same document that has been brought back through and, 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 and whitewashed and looks different, but it's the same thing, we go through the same drill again. Right. But, Brenda, something strange that you will notice. I've had the president twice celebrate the judiciary. When the BBI was, uh, decision was made, uh, I remember uh, um, the president, the then uh, President Ruto being a deputy, said, 
this is a very independent judiciary, it's a <laughs> God-given judiciary, <laughs> hip prices. I mean, just that stopped, time... It <laughs> stopped reggae. <laughs> it, it, because the reggae stopped. Yeah. <laughs> when we had a Supreme Court uh, presidential dispute, presidential and the decision was made, and there was declared president, then he again said, this is it. This yeah. is a very independent institution. Twelve months down the line, is alleging that the same uh, uh, institution now is not only corrupt, mm -hmm. but incompetent. I've argued elsewhere that if there is an arm of government that exudes competence, it is the judiciary. Because it's made up of professionals with qualifications that are set out, that are clear, mm -hmm. academic and professional qualification. Mm -hmm. There is no arm of, of, of government, either the executive or the, uh, the legislature, that has the same standards. Right. So if it's a question of competence, then you can't get in another arm right. except in the judiciary. Right. But, th but then, um, before I move to Senator, uh, let me just pick your mind on this, uh, um, Anyoka. Um, majority, National Assembly Majority Leader, yes. Kimani Chungwa, saying that um, the House is concluding the enactment of the housing bill that will address the issues raised by the court. Uh, and he says that, uh, uh, you know, public participation has been ongoing and in due course, uh, the country will have a new housing fund act that will make sure the housing agenda continues. Do you think the sentiments of Kenyans will be implemented this time round? Because, I mean, LSK gave their, <laughs> their voice yes. when public participation was being done. FKE, you know, different stakeholders here in the country did the same and they felt like our voices were not heard. Then you gave us this housing levy. Do you think this time round, this will be hard? Like, it will be implemented, the voice of Kenyans? I, I am not very hopeful that it will. Uh, chances are, the, this, this for me, and I look at it as uh, what we normally call budgeted corruption. Somebody somewhere wants this bill, this levy, or this money deducted from Kenyans, whichever way, by hook and crooks, whether it comes through this bill or through another option, they really want to get this particular money. Mm -hmm. And when you see a government that ignores the wishes of its own people, Remember, the president, the executive, all the public office holders are holding this power in trust. Look at the constitution of Kenya. It's designed with the people, mm -hmm. with the Kenyans. We own the governance, but then we allow particular institutions and office holders to exercise that power on behalf of us Kenyans. Mm -hmm. Now, that is why it was very necessary. You look at that content of the constitution that sets out particular parameters for good governance, one of them being public participation. That being the case, when Kenyans are telling you, we do not want mm -hmm. <laughs> you to take our money and build for us a house in the manner that you are suggesting, then you ignore it. Then it tells you that you have actually gone outside your, uh, your mandate. Mm -hmm. it, you've gone outside what your duty and obligation is as a public officer. The president is insulated for now from right. uh, prosecution or being taken to court. But I am very sure that the rest are not. So if some things go, even if this uh, act of parliament gets to be passed in parliament, I doubt, I don't have confidence that the parliament is able to debate objectively, objectively based that on that particular. Okay. It will be an order. Remember when the president has been on record saying, I'm watching to see who will not vote. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so. let, me, let me just request our director, uh, Justina. Justina, if you can hear me, um, I just want to have uh, our viewers to, you can get me. I just want us to have... Um, a look at what uh, the Court of Appeal, the reasons they gave for actually ruling, uh, uh, giving us the, the state order still to, mean, to, to remain in terms of uh, this housing levy not to be implemented, the collection. So now the judges of the Court of Appeal said that, um, of course, the housing levy was introduced without a legal framework. Gentlemen, we've discussed that. And that, um, let me just get this. Uh, Justina, just uh, hold on. Don't take it away from there. I'm just trying to get it correctly. Um, yeah, I got it. Uh, housing levy was introduced without a legal framework. We've uh, had a discussion about that. The court's decision was based on public interest. Tills in favor of not granting the order sought by government. No single contract was placed in court by state to support the claim of breach of contract because the government went ahead and said that the works, the construction works have already begun. So, but they didn't put, you know, they didn't take any single contract uh, place it in court, and then the housing levy was targeting a section of Kenyans. You know, that, those are some of the reasons as to why the Court of Appeal stopped the housing levy deduction until the case is heard and determined. So let me just uh, channel this question to Okia Omutata, the senator for Busia. The court said the decision was based on public interest. 
which tilts in favor of not granting the order sought by government, then comes in majority leader who appeals, I mean Kimani Chumwa, the National Assembly majority leader, who appeals to the judiciary to give priority to the interest of the people, especially government projects. I think that the, well, I think, I think the best color of the judiciary did to give priority to the people mm -hmm. of this country as a public interest was, and they were, they were saying, if we allow this law that has been declared unconstitutional to continue, which means people are continuing being deducted, then they're going to contracts, mm -hmm. begin building these houses with that money. Then when we make our final decision, we find that the high court was correct. Mm -hmm. that, will, that will create chaos. So the public interest will not be served with that route. The public interest is better served when we say suspend everything, hold on, the way the High Court found, mm -hmm. let us hold it there, then give us time to look into your issues. You are getting grievances you have against this decision. That way, even if we, even if we dismiss the High, high Court ruling, mm -hmm. you can still uh, collect money and proceed with the way you, are, you want to proceed. Mm -hmm. So the public interest was that the society should be functioning in an orderly manner. Mm -hmm. Not that house, that government projects should be given priority. The public interest in a proper functioning of society, not in government projects being implemented. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. But at the same time, um, you know, the housing levy was targeting a section of Kenyans. So when we are, uh, the, not we, but the court, <laughs> <laughs> when the court was saying that the housing levy was targeting, a, yes. it was discriminatory yes. it was done in a discriminatory way targeting a section of kenyans then the court says that uh, it was based on a public interest that's why they did their ruling then the government comes in through the majority leader also look at you know the interest of the government for projects the president comes in and says this would have given kenyans um you know employment so and when uh, that sort of a case is taken to the here is the government with his um let me try and be the devil's advocate here so here's the government with his genuine concern then here is that public interest. So how does the court balance? Uh, the ultimate public interest is in the law. And that Article 47, clause 1, is very clear. That administrative action must be lawful, procedural, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that one is a trump card. What the government is doing is administrative. Mm -hmm. So is it lawful? Is it efficient? Is it procedural? So that's like what the court is looking at. So unless they, may, unless, and unless they cross that threshold, mm -hmm. then they cannot claim to be serving the public interest because there's no public interest outside the law. Mm -hmm. All that is in the public interest is codified in the law. All right. That's our understanding. All right. So when the government feels that whatever it wants to do, it must breach the law, mm -hmm. then there's no public interest there's in no that. There's no public interest there. Yeah. Um, this, this, this case is still at the Court of Appeal, and it will be, you call it, the legal mind call it pre, prejudice? Like you cannot <laughs> subjudice. Sub, sub you cannot um, discuss what's still live along the corridors of justice within the courts. But let me just pick your mind on this without dwelling too much into it because you're still interested parties in that, not interested parties in that case, but you're the people who took the government to the we court. Are litigating. Yeah, yeah, you're litigating. Um, I would just like to pick your mind on this. Based on what we saw at the High Court, then now you've moved to the Court of Appeal. They've given their decision, which is similar to what the High Court gave, with their reasons. Is there a chance? Does the government stand a chance of winning this case? Okay, let, let me just uh, clarify something. What the government was trying to do was to stop the implementation or the coming into effect of the decision by the three bench as they filed the appeal. Now, one of the reasons why the court, the court of appeal, was not convinced mm -hmm. that there was a need to stop the court, the, the three-bench court that declared that law to be unconstitutional, mm -hmm. is the question of public interest. And how they arrived at that is this: they looked at the housing le housing fund bill of uh, 2023. The housing uh, uh, bill is intended to regularize some of the issues that the three bench said mm -hmm. was a problem in the manner in which the government had implemented the previous law. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, if you're already implementing the decision of the three bench, 
And one of the main, one of the main issues that was uh, uh, raised by the three bench is that there was no framework. There was no legal framework. framework yeah. So the government now has proposed a legal framework to answer the three bench. So the Court of Appeal is asking, if you're already implementing this decision, why then do you want to stop it so that you can continue collecting this levy? And also, you're telling us there is even no refund mechanism. So you will find somewhere in that decision that the court has agreed with an argument that was presented that when you find yourself in a hole, you have to stop digging. So what the government wanted to do is to continue digging, continue collecting this money until they pass the regulatory framework. And when they pass the framework, then they abandon the other, pro, uh, the other and continue with. So they did not want a break in the collection of, of this money. And that is why the Court of Appeal disagreed with them and said, no, we are not going to suspend this because, of course, of also other reasons in, in, in law in terms of how then you suspend a declaration of unconstitutionality. Right. So that's, that's the first thing. So the second thing is that uh, it is going to be very interesting uh, for them to continue uh, with the appeal and also continue in parliament to enact the regulatory framework to support the housing level. So one has to give it. They have to decide which one they want to go with. Do they, are they aggrieved by the decision of the High Court? They do not agree with it, and so they need the Court of Appeal to hear and determine that appeal and say, no, the High Court was wrong. Mm -hmm. Because what then happens, if they pass the housing levy, and the Court of Appeal then delivers a decision and says, we disagree with the High Court. There was no need to have a foundational law. It is not discriminatory. It, uh, you know, it does not target a particular section of the, there is uh, one of the other things was, uh, you know, the, 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 the was, fact uh, that the, uh, the aspect of accountability. Yeah. The, the court says, no, we disagree. We think that there are adequate mechanisms for accountability. We disagree with the decision of the high court and it is therefore set aside. Yet they have already passed another regulation to uh, support that. So you will be having two pieces of legislation that actually support the housing levy. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where, uh, that's, that's how uh, absurd mm -hmm. this situation is. And, 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 and I, I really pity the government uh, in the situation that it finds itself. But this is one where they just have to go back to the drawing board, mm -hmm. uh, bring in uh, 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 stakeholders, and have a discussion and say, we want to do this. Right. How can we do it within the confines of the law? Already as it is right now, and from what I have explained, they are on a false start. Mm -hmm. And what it basically means is that ultimately, they will not be able to achieve what they intend to achieve. Right. Noble right. as it could be. Noble as it could be. Right, so we, I'm, I'm, you know, I was about to tell you that uh, you know, you, you at Standard Group, you're giving free legal advice <laughs> <laughs> to the government just based on your explanation mm -hmm. on, on, on what you have said. And you know, it's good that you're having legal minds on this set. Um, so let me also request um, once again, you probably uh, you keep on hearing me say the name of Justina, that is our director, um, girl power in the house. So Justina, oh, what I need <laughs> again is that graphics for, not, not that one for the Court of Appeal, but the one for uh, the court stopping deployment of police officers uh, to Haiti. And I hope you've gotten it. Yes, there you have it. Thank you, Justina. And the court says that the National Security Council does not have the legal powers to deploy regular police um, outside of the, uh, I mean, out of the, outside the country. Uh, deployment needs to be undertaken in accordance with the constitution government to challenge high court's decision at the court of appeal that is what the government uh through the government spokesperson isaac mora said uh, this evening uh, that the government will challenge the high court's decision at the court of appeal and um just based on this um anyoka we are seeing um here uh, justice um checha says that deployment needs to be undertaken in accordance with the constitution this is according to when it comes to the deployment of police to Haiti. 
Now, when you look at the Court of Appeal, there was no legal framework. Yes. So does it, it looks like the government is just doing things haphazardly without looking at, at the Constitution. Uh, clearly, based on what we are getting, <laughs> the interpretations we are getting uh, from the court. You know, um, the Constitution sets constitutional mandates for each of um, the various arms of government. And the mandate for interpretation of the law is purely a preserve of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. So that whatever decision you do, whatever action, even if you imagine that you've interpreted it correctly and somebody somewhere does not agree with you, mm -hmm. then that dispute on interpretation can all be made through uh, the judicial process. Mm -hmm. And in this case, they have pronounced themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think the issue of the deployment of the National Police Service officers to outside the country is a very clear issue. Any first-year student of law looking at the Constitution, <laughs> reading plainly, will tell you the government is wrong. I mean, without the reasonable man on an yes. omnibus, and <laughs> Kenyan, just take the Constitution, look at the provisions, and see what the government is doing. Will tell you. Here there's a problem. They may not yeah. understand the details. Yeah. Perhaps uh, they may not look at the other many legal interpretations. But mm -hmm. it is one of the clearest mm -hmm. cases where the government uh, has taken a step, mm -hmm. which I, I, I have a lot of tremendous respect for the president mm -hmm. in terms of his educational abilities, his wisdom. And I doubt whether on this one was even serious. Why? Because... <laughs> He, he, he knows that he cannot... I think he was playing uh, some PR stunt to uh, somebody somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, just took it far and, and um, somehow is aware that he may not go very far with it. Mm -hmm. Because truly speaking, there's no legal justification for it. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple and as plain as that. There isn't even nothing much to discuss about. You know, mm -hmm. there are decisions that the government can make, make that falls on the borderline of interpretation, 50-50. Mm -hmm. Whichever way you look at it, this, the scales can tilt mm -hmm. either side, depending mm -hmm. on the need. Mm -hmm. But there are those ones that are very clear, including the mandate and what you can do and what you can't do. Mm -hmm. I have said before, and let me say it again, that even the president is a creature of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. President uh, William Ruto is not there by virtue that uh, he just found himself there. We went through a constitutional process yeah. by election. There was a dispute. Went through the, the legal process. And the process, by the terminal uh, part of the process, he was declared president. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's the president as is. It does not mean that all Kenyans wanted him to be president. There could be quite a number of Kenyans who didn't want him to be president. But he is by virtue of that particular legal process. Right. So we have to respect the, the Constitution, the, pro the setup, the, 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 the safeguards that have been provided. Mm -hmm. And each person can only go as far as the powers that you have been given for constitutionally right. and with the various legislative right. uh, frameworks that All we right. have. Omuteta, I, I need to ask you this question. I, I know you, you are not the government. You're not <laughs> part of the government. I am part of the government. Okay, you are part of the government in terms of... As, a, as an MP. Yes, as, a, as an MP <laughs> representing the people of Busia. <laughs> what I mean is <laughs> part of the Kenya Kwanzaa regime, okay. the government. That's, that, that's, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um... Most, many Kenyans had opposed, you know, the deployment of the police officers to Haiti because of security issues. What do you think is our interest as a country? Well, I think the issue with Haiti is a bit uh, difficult to wrap one's head around because uh, the history of Haiti is like a microcosm of what happened to the black people mm -hmm. and the way they were tortured and all the things that have happened. And even they're denying them the self-determination, the resource cars that is, is affecting the Congo, whatever, because Haiti is very rich in minerals. Mm -hmm. That resource cars is there. And so, like some of us have said, if you want to solve Haiti's problem, send Father Restil back to power. He's in South Africa. He's the popular president. He was kicked out by the US. Send mm -hmm. him back to, to Haiti. But... Uh, the global politics, mm -hmm. which are controlled by the, the U.S., is they don't want to see a free Haiti. All the guns that are, all these thugs are having are coming from the United States, you see. If you look at the history of the gangs in the Haiti, the Toton Makuts, who are, who are being put in by Papadok and Baby Doc, when they came in, mm -hmm. 
and began supplement. That's how the, the gangs were formed by the United States to try and distort the order that was within the Republic of Haiti. And so they have matured, and that's where we are today. So, and this is where Kenya was going, is that usually a peacekeeping force goes to enforce a political process. Right now in Haiti, there's no political process to resolve the issues there. So they're going there as an invading army, you see. And I don't think the Kenya police has the firepower to invade and uh, subdue mm -hmm. Haiti. Mm -hmm. If they can't do it in Capedo here, <laughs> and they could do it thousands of miles away. All right. So I think the issue is that the politics around it was whereby those who control the global power structure wanted a black country to give them cover mm -hmm. for what they wanted to do in Haiti. Right. And Kenya gladly get offered, itself offered itself as the clock right. that will be put around what they wanted to do. But if they want a solution in Haiti, mm -hmm. allow for the restate to go back to power. All right, all right. Gentlemen, um, I'm seeing my time is up, so I'll give a minute to um, each one of us a closing remarks. Um, and theory, I mean, the court saying that um, this is what the court says, that the National Security Council does not have the legal power to deploy regular police uh, outside the country. Then the government says that we are going to challenge the high, high court's decision at the Court of Appeal. So they're going to challenge at the high... <laughs> Looks like you already know my question. <laughs> okay. No, 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 it's, it's hilarious, but you could finish it. <laughs> Okay, my, my, my question is, because it looks like you, you've already understood my question, even before I finish, but my question is, the court is telling you that the National Security Council does not have the legal powers to deploy police outside the country. Then you're saying you're going to challenge, yet the court, the court has told you it has used the Constitution. So when you're going to the Court of Appeal to challenge this, yet your decision has also been challenged on the basis that you did not follow the laid down procedure within the Constitution. So what are they going to challenge? Well, let, let's say they're going to challenge the interpretation uh, by the High Court. Uh, but it's a very slippery road. And uh, to be quite honest, I wish them the best of luck. Um, and, 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 and this is uh, something that is extremely sometimes disturbing, uh, that um, very, very clear, very, very clear provisions of the law that have no ambiguity whatsoever are uh, overlooked as uh, this issue was overlooked. I have received, I, I can tell you that uh, when you walk around and you meet uh, police officers who are our brothers and sisters, they were worried about this deployment because the situation in Haiti is horrendous mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, the security. Mm -hmm. They are people who are playing uh, shooting games with people on the street. You're walking on the street and there's a marksman on top of a building and he's shooting at people with a high caliber rifle just for fun. So the rival gangs that are there the situation is so bad mm -hmm. that when you look at it and you ask, besides the law, mm -hmm. when you look at the situation that is obtaining in Haiti, you actually ask yourself how a government, thinking of its people, can actually intend to subject its citizens mm -hmm. to that kind of an environment, even though right. you may say that they are properly trained. Right. But besides that is the fact that uh, the, the, there are very, very clear provisions of the law uh, that were ignored mm -hmm. in, in this process. And so um, what then you expect the, 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 the Court of Appeal to be looking at is then looking at the law, looking at the decision that has been <laughs> made by the High Court All right. and, 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 and asking themselves, and, and I'm trying to put myself in the position of those judges, mm. how do you help? All right. How do you help the government? <laughs> okay, um, Chata is laughing. You're closing remarks in a minute. Um, and you have actually run out of time. Just a minute. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Let me just say that uh, the government needs to go to the drawing board. The signs aren't good. 
it should uh, the president should talk less. If mm -hmm. I were to give him free advice, if, and I mean, should talk less, listen to what the other arms of government are doing. Uh, is the president? It is not time for politics. Let him interrogate what they the, 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 it's coming out from the courts, so that then he can be able to change the policy approach to many of the projects that he wants. Otherwise, he's going to have a lot of difficult time. And they have started quite early, it's just one year down the line, uh, with nothing really tangible for this government to look mm -hmm. at. And mm -hmm. if he takes this path, we'll have five years of so fast, mm -hmm. having done nothing. All right, all right. Yes. Okay, um, Tata. Well, for me, I always pray for the president. I want President Ruto to succeed. I always pray for him. When I'm saying my rosary, I always make intentions for the president, for the vice president, and for the cabinet, that they may sober up and look at the law as an enabler, not an, not, not an, not an, ob, an, uh, an obstruction. And uh, I really pray with the president, I plead and say that, my brother, there are no two ways to eat. You cannot operate outside the law in this mm -hmm. country. Yes, so you can only operate within the law. Because if you choose to go outside the law, it's not only you who has the capacity to go outside the law. Each Kenyan has got the power to go outside the law. And then what, 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 what are you talking about? It's anarchy. So just stay within the law, and whatever good intentions you have for this country, mm -hmm. the law has the capacity to allow them to come to fruition. So to me, I prayed to my brother, and I keep on praying for him, and I'll keep on praying for President Ruto to see the light and come back, to step back mm -hmm. and govern this country. Because if Ruto fails, we can't afford to lose another five years. We want Ruto to succeed. If Ruto succeeds, we are all hallelujah. We shall all be happy. Mm -hmm. But the way he's going, he's trying to drive us off the cliff. The economy is in shambles. Nothing seems to be working. Right now, if you look at every Kenyan is destitute, allow Kenyans to produce, come up with the policies that will allow us to produce. Let us deal with the debts that are facing us, let us audit these debts. Mm -hmm. Let us separate what we are supposed to pay from what we are not supposed to pay, then pay what we are supposed to pay. All right. It's a very simple exercise to do. All right. So let him do that and I think we shall go ahead. But just to allow the white man, a man who colonized us, a man who enslaved us, a man who did all manner of evil things to a black man to come and run this country today. I don't know what adjective, adjectives I, I can use, but it's not smart. All right. All right. Okay, I'm but I'll pray yes. for him. you pray and for And I'll him. continue praying for him. I believe in prayer. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure my prayers will work. That, work. that the president will turn around mm -hmm. and drive this country in the right direction and tell all of us rally mm -hmm. behind him mm -hmm. and cheer him. All right, and on a light note, probably someone who's watching us is saying, we are also praying for you not to go to the court. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge. But, but, but that is precisely a place for everybody. Yeah, to yeah, exactly. Him that was on a light Kenya. note. Yeah, that was on a light <laughs> note, Senator. That was on a light note. <laughs> yeah, we still remain to be friends. Give me a high five. <laughs> Thank you for making it to KT News. Senator Okia Mutata, Busia Senator, and also um, Dennis Anyoka, an advocate and president of the Lewis Society of Kenya, Eric Theory. Gentlemen, Asante Nisana, but uh, still, let's maintain on our seats because we need to take this next story. Uh, Justina, do we go with Subkem or Mudavadi? All right, so let's have a look at Subkem, where the leadership of the Supreme uh, Council of Kenya Muslims, led by Hassan Olenadu, has expressed concern over the leadership tasso bring in the organization with Yusuf Zibo um, claiming to be the bona fide chairperson of the organization. Uh, speaking in Nairobi during a meeting that brought together Subkem uh, regional coordinators, um, uh, the national deputy chairman, that is Sheriff Kitami, said the former leadership was legally removed on disciplinary grounds. The matter is still pending in court. Mr. Yusuf Abdurrahman Nzibo ceased to hold any position in Subkem, having been removed as such official national chairman by the National Executive Committee meeting resolution made on 17th November 2019 and confirmed on 18th January 2020 by the National Governing Council NGC of Subkem. Copies of the documents ascertaining these facts are available in the council. 
and have already been furnished upon the registrar of societies. Indeed, Yusuf Nzibo was the immediate former chairman of SUPKEM, who was removed from office by the appropriate organs of the Supreme Council on disciplinary grounds. We were therefore surprised when Mr. Nzibo emerged the other day with claims that he is the bona fide national chairman of SUPKEM, despite the situation prevailing in court. In this regard, Mr. Nzibo's letter claiming to be the bona fide national chairman should be ignored and be treated with contempt it deserves. Yeah. Now the leadership of the we've talked about, we've had a look at that. Let's have a look at uh, you know uh, Prime Cabinet Secretary Musalia Mudavadi's visit to China, and uh, it is that Kenya has actually committed to respect the territorial and sovereignty of nations. Prime Cabinet Secretary Musalia Mudavadi, who is also the Foreign and Diaspora Affairs Cabinet Secretary, met his Chinese counterpart uh, one year uh, in China and discussed multilateral mission. Uh, to Haiti as mandated by the United Nations Security Council. The two unanimously agreed to uphold um, uh, the universal values of peace and development, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom, and oppose interference in the internal affairs of other countries under the banner of democracy and human rights. <laughs> It is now apparent that China is an extremely important partner for Kenya. Extremely important. And uh, when I told the president that I had received an official invitation uh, from the foreign minister here, uh, Honorable Wang Yi, he said, do not hesitate. It's clear that China is very pivotal on global issues, on regional issues, and they're going to play an important role, not just today, but going forward, including in multilateral uh, bodies, such as the United Nations and, and other critical areas in the financial realm and so many others. So we have no option but to really engage with China at the highest level and very, very uh, seriously. Now, Unilever has partnered with, uh, Farm, uh, with Farm to Market Alliance. Um, uh, let me just take that. It's actually that Uni Unilever has partnered with the Farm uh, to Market Alliance and the University of Nairobi to launch the Great Millet Quest competition. The competition seeks to inspire the most uh, intensive university students to develop sustainable and innovative products. Um, uh, uh, actually, innovative products based on millet. And according to Luca Ocheng, this will also empower farmers to supply more millet and promote generative agriculture. But the overall theme really is about driving greater food security and creating uh, market opportunities around millet as well. What are some of the challenges that uh, farmers would normally struggle with? Uh, the biggest one really is access to the market. Really, yeah, that's the main one. Uh, access to market, but also losses that come through storage. Yeah? Yeah, sorry, practice. Uh, we think that if uh, support could come uh, from the government in those two areas, it will help. Huh? We have uh, allocated over 2 billion uh, Kenya shillings towards supporting localization and especially around nutrition space. And millet falls in that as well. The global supply chain has got massive disruptions over the last uh, uh, few years. And with that, we are seeing also in the Kenya, the dollar is under pressure. We think we can contribute by driving greater localization and sourcing of produce uh, locally rather than spending dollars out there. And in so doing, uh, apart from the impact on demand on Forex, also it creates a market and opportunity for farmers as well. Thank you for watching and thank you for your time and your company. My name is Brenda Zedar Adida, sign language interpreter for tonight's bulletin is Philip Omondi. It's all smiles because the weekend begins now. Enjoy the rest of your viewing and keep safe over the weekend. Good night.